Hello class, here we are at the beginning of week five, I guess we're day two, so early on. Um, and I want to I share a couple thoughts on my philosophy of learning, my philosophy of education, teaching, and all that. So I would mentioned last week I was going to post this, and you probably noticed um, that there was a bit of um, uh, kind of quiet, right? So there was a bit of um, you just engaging in the content on your own, thinking through your responses. There was no interaction that was required, so it was just kind of a week of taking a deep breath. And I think that was a, it was a week of taking a deep breath for everybody. So as I'm following the conversation that you're having at this point with yourself as you're responding to the questions, you're thinking through the content, I thought I would share a couple of things, uh, specifically why I do that, how I think that's helpful, and then what I'm really hoping that you'll get out of a learning experience like the one that you are currently in. Okay. So if you have ever taught before, um, maybe some of you have taught in a K-12 through setting, maybe some of you um, have taught in a junior college setting, maybe some at a university setting, or maybe you even kind of maybe taught at a um, Sunday school, at a church, a Bible study, or something like that. One of the things that we have to do is think through our philosophy and our approach to teaching and what it is that we hope our learners, so those that we're, we're instructing, will actually take away how do we think they learn. You know, I was reading this morning, a friend of mine was posting something on Facebook about VARC, so these different learning styles. And you have, you know, this the spectrum, right? People from one side say, oh yeah, I, you know, I do everything by, you know, VARC and the learning styles. And then the other side says, it's basically just a bunch of pseudoscience. And and probably the reality is it's somewhere maybe, maybe in the middle, right? So there's some things you can kind of throw to the wayside and then some things you want to hold on to. So learning is really interesting. It's a really important thing. And, and I need to think about how do I teach, you know, here we are with adult learners. So in graduate school, thinking about uh, I can't teach you in the same way that I would teach um, a first year student as I have, you know, I teach all the way from, from freshmen, incoming freshmen, all the way up to graduate professional students, as you are, obviously. Um, and I have to think about how do I teach differently in the face-to-face -face classroom versus that of uh, the online classroom. So um, you think about, and some would even call this cybergogy. So what's my approach to teaching in an online classroom? And you're thinking, wait, wait a second, we're four weeks in, you're now telling me, I think it's important so you can kind of see my approach to things. And, and I, I, frankly, I'm a little hands off in an online classroom because I know that if I, and I think I've mentioned this before, if I were to do an hour long lecture, um, in an online classroom, first of all, you would never watch it. So it's a waste of my time to do it in the first place because an hour long instruction and lecture, I mean, these videos that I do are sometimes between 12 and 15 minutes and even that, I mean, if we're being you know frank, that's, that's a little bit too long for an online classroom. You're like, dude, would you just hurry up and get to the point? So an hour long instruction, that doesn't work, right? So, and, and if we facilitate, and this is really what we're doing, facilitate the questions correctly to pull out what's there in the content, I think this online education can be quite meaningful. I would even say that for the student, I think I've mentioned this before as well, the student that is going to be, um, they're going to, they, um, my preference is to be more introverted than extroverted. You are processing things internally. So the idea that you have, you know, from Monday uh, to Wednesday to respond to your question. You have a full, you know, two or three days to respond, to think about what you want to say and then respond, and then to engage in conversation in the next, you know, three, three or four days. I'm not an introvert. That's not my preference. My preference is more extroversion, but I can only imagine that that extra time to think in an online classroom is, is a wonderful thing. Because if we're in a face-to-face -face classroom and I ask you a question and you feel like you've been put on the spot, that's and you have a class of 16 people, that's there's this like, oh, I don't, I don't want to respond to that. So we have to factor in there different learning styles. And, you know, again, Vark, say what you want about that. But there are different learning styles we have to think about, okay? We have to think about personality. We have to think about different uh, modality of, of, of delivery, right? So... When I think about teaching, I'm, I'm pretty intentional. I shouldn't say pretty. I'm very intentional with how I come across with the content delivery, okay? So because here, here's the thing that was said um, not too long ago. Um, <clears throat> and I love this. I want to read this to you. I'm going to post this as well. So um, uh, one of the, I guess you'd call them intellectual heroes of mine, a gentleman by the name of Howie Hendricks, uh, he wrote a book 
titled Teaching to Change Lives, okay? Uh, seven Proven Ways to Make Your Teaching Come Alive. And he says this, I want to read this verbatim so you hear this. They're not my words, I wish they were, but they're not, they're his. He says this, he says, um, in learning, you'll discover that some of your values and habits need to be retained. Some of them need to be refined, and some of them need to be rejected outright. But we're all in the same boat because we're all in process. He says, and in that process, how wonderful it is to ask, am I doing the right things? And I love this part. He says, one of the greatest fears I have for my students, he says after graduation, but I would say after a class that I teach, is not that they will fail, but that they will succeed at doing the wrong things. That they'll te uh, reach the end of the line and discover that this isn't the destination they wanted and it can't fulfill them. I, I just love that, that comment. Because as I think about what we're doing in these classes, how we're doing this, I have to think about that. Not that you're going to fail, because, uh, hear me, uh, I don't think that if you do the work, uh, I, let me say it this way, if you do the work in this class, you're consistently doing the work, you do all the assignments, you engage in the conversations, you know, if you have uh, some, some of my online classes have quizzes, some have case studies, you know, all of those different things. If you do the work, you will pass this class. It, it's almost um, more difficult to fail this class than it is to pass this class. And I would say that regardless of the content, you know, I'm, I'm making this video for all of the sections of class I'm teaching because I think it's just kind of something you need to know about me, whether it's organizational behavior or career development theories and techniques. The information that you are um, taking in, that you're learning, it may be new information, but I don't think that anyone would say that it's incredibly challenging information the way that statistics, um, you know, uh, or some, you know, um, physics class maybe, right? We're learning about people, we're learning about theories, we're learning about things that actually right now, not that physics and math don't relate, but right now they're things that I'm like living and I'm watching them happen in my life, right? I love math, I love physics. I don't understand a lot of math, I don't understand any physics, but I know there's a place for that. But in our courses, in this content, it's not the like, I don't understand it. When you think about culture, when you think about you know, career choice, these are things that we just get, right? We understand them because we're, we're experiencing them pretty much every day of our lives. So the content's not challenging. So what I need to do in developing the content is to curate the content in a way that you get the most meaningful learning experience out of that. And, and I think that, um, peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is what takes place primarily in an online classroom, of course it does in the face-to-face, -face. but when I'm asking you to engage in conversation, to think about things, to give input and insight based upon what someone else has said, <clears throat> again, I'm setting the table and letting you kind of dig into the meat of the content. What you take away from it, that's entirely up to you, but that's also the same case as it would be in a face-to-face -face classroom. You just have a different concentrated ability and timing to think about things than you do compared to that of, an, of a face-to-face -face class. So you may actually, you know, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you may meet once a week, right? So all classes at the graduate level that I teach anyway meet once a week. We meet once in the face-to-face. -face. We meet once a week, and you then have to you know, obviously you have your books, but you have to kind of retain what it is that you've thought about so that you can engage in conversation. Where in an online classroom, you have the book here on your desk that you can be typing and go, what was that? And you don't have to, you don't have to say, hold on a second, let me find it. You can, you can just pause from typing and go look for it. So the learning is actually very different. And I bet if we were to take a poll and I would ask you, how are you retaining information? Not necessarily are you, but how are you retaining? How are you learning? What are your big takeaways? You would probably say in some way that it's different than it is in a face-to-face -face classroom. So my involvement, my engagement is to really, like I said, set the table. Here's the other thing too that I wanna, I wanna point out. Grades. Um, so that whole thing that Howie Hendricks say, it's not that they would fail, but they would succeed at doing the wrong things. Um, 
And and what he doesn't mean necessarily, at least how I'm reading it, is fail getting an F. Um, there's a lot of things we could say about that. Failure. Grades. I have to be careful here because it's the hand that feeds me. But grades are an interesting thing that I have this I have a love-hate relationship with. Because I think they get in the way of learning in many ways. We're so concentrated on what grade I'm going to get that it gets in the way of learning. You know, a lot of you, um, you're used to rubrics. And I don't like rubrics, frankly, because they get in the way of learning. Because instead of you looking at the assignment and going, okay, did I meet the requirements of what's asked of me in the assignment? Did I critically think through the content? Did I analyze things? Was I creative, right? Was I curious enough to ask the right questions to come up with the right outputs, the product? Was it correct? You just check a box. And so if you're so focused on getting a grade, then you miss out, I think, in many ways, the learning. And I am so much more interested in what you learned than what grade you got. And, and as you all know, I mean, now, uh, those of you in the MFT program, there are some state BBS requirements for grades and what you can get in different um, courses to qualify for licensure. But no one's ever going to ask you on, an, on a resume, typically, or an interview, I'm sorry, what's your GPA? You know, if you came out of high school, it mattered going to grads, uh, undergrad, and, and obviously undergrad to grad and so forth. Those things matter. But but, but did you actually learn? Like, I, I wonder if we, what would happen if we started changing the questions we asked? Instead of what's your GPA, what were your biggest learnings? That's a different question. Um, I had a very high GPA in high school, as I'm sure most, if not many, if not all of you did. Um, but did I actually retain the content? It's a good question. I don't know that I did. In some classes I did, but not entirely. So learning, education, teaching, all of that that we're experiencing right now, I'm looking at things, and you're probably experiencing this, and some of you go, oh, it's driving crazy. I look at things very differently because I am looking at perhaps in a little bit different way um, some, some varied end goals. All right, so when you're writing papers, I'm... I'm, of course, interested in the grammar. I'm, in poor, of course, interested in the spelling. But I'm really interested in what's the message of what you're saying. Did you not just accomplish what I asked, but did you think about things in creative, curious, critical, kind of um, synthesized, analytical ways to really get at the heart of the assignment? Um, and, and, and now, hear me, if, if it's not written well, I miss that because I'm so busy trying to compute what it is that you wrote because the grammar of the spelling is off. So all of that matters, but I'm looking at things um, through an even more critical lens because I really want to see, did you get at the heart of the assignment? Did you take the information in and compute it in ways that it's going to stay with you rather than just regurgitate it out? Um, to give an answer, put on a paper to check a box. I don't want to get at that. So I hope that helps to kind of shine some light on how I approach teaching. Um, I'll post that quote from Howie Hendricks. I think that'll be helpful for many of you um, to kind of read through that. Uh, and then um, we'll continue on the next four weeks of this class. And as you think about where we've been, kind of the rear view mirror, and then you think about where we're going, think about my approach that I'm taking to this class to set the table to help you kind of dig in and, and, and take advantage of all these different opportunities to touch the content. Yes, there's brief instruction, but really it's, it's identifying what I've kind of found to be the meat of the banquet, the learning banquet. And, and I think that, you know, when you have that wonderful meal, you go to a friend's house and you have just an amazing meal and the conversation is rich. The thing that you're talking about is um, not necessarily, oh, that their home was so, it was adorned so beautifully, but you're talking about the meat of the conversation. You're talking about the meal that you have. Man, that was an amazing salad. That was an amazing fill in the blank, whatever it was. And I want you to be able to say about our learning experiences together. That was an amazing experience where I got so much meat to really inform the way that I think about things so I can go out and be all the more effective in my work. Okay, so I'll post another video uh, specific to this upcoming week, um, but there's some thoughts and insight into how I think about education, teaching, and learning. We will see you online.